Okay, we're in the home stretch now, everybody. This is the last module uh, of the course. So again, we're going to split this into uh, a theory lecture and then uh, a practical session after the coffee break. Uh, so this module is on genome assembly. I alluded to this uh, yesterday morning when I talked about uh, genome sequencing. And the goal of the lecture here is to give you sort of an understanding of the fundamentals of what we mean by assembling a genome. Uh, then an overview of how some of the algorithms work. Then I'll talk a little bit about short and long read assembly, some of the differences between approaches of whether you have Illumina reads uh, versus longer sequencing data. Uh, and then at the very end, I'll give you some pitfall, pitfalls about how assembly can go wrong and uh, some of the things that we can do uh, to fix that. Then, of course, you'll have a chance to practice uh, assembly on some data that we've provided. All right, well, let's start with a very basic question. What is a genome assembly? Um, it's essentially reversing the sequencing process. When we sequence a genome, we take our genome for doing whole genome shotgun data. We fragment it into many pieces, millions or billions of pieces. We figure out the sequence of those individual pieces using whatever our sequencing technology of choice is. And then the assembly process is just reversing that. We're going to take all of those reads and try to reconstruct what our original genome sequence was. Now, this is in complete absence of a reference genome. So when you do a de novo genome assembly, you're not using the reference genome. You have nothing to align the reads to. You just need to compare the reads against each other and figure out what the structure of the genome was. Now, in this cartoon that I've, I've drawn for genome assembly, uh, we've segmented the genome into portions that are unique and portions that are repetitive. And the portions that are repetitive are shown in these red bars here, where it's uh, present in three different copies. Now, these are going to be the real challenge of assembling the genome. And that when we have one of these repeats that's longer than the length of our reads, like if you have a repeat that's a thousand bases and you have a hundred base per Illumina read, we can't actually figure out the order of what these pieces go in because the read, the, the read doesn't cross the repeat boundary into this unique sequence. So that's why we're going to want to focus on uh, trying to assemble either the unique regions, if you have short reads, or getting longer reads such that you can span the different copies uh, of the repetitive regions. All right, so here's the overview. I'm going to talk about how assemblers work, some of the theory. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some assembly algorithms for short and long reads. And then finally, uh, what are some of the factors of genomes that make an assembly a difficult problem? <clears throat> so typically when we assemble data, we talk about whole genome shotgun sequencing. So whole genome shotgun sequencing is the idea that we just randomly fragment our genome into these millions of pieces, sequence the individual pieces, and then try to reconstruct the sequence. So the shotgun refers to the idea that you've just kind of blasted your genome into just these millions of pieces. You have no idea how the pieces uh, relate to each other, but we need to computationally figure that out. So in this cartoon here, we have our input sequence, which is our genome. We take many copies of our genome. We then fragment it and then figure out the sequence of these individual fragments. Now, if we knew the ordering of the fragments along our genome, if we knew that this se sequence that starts G GGC is taken from the first position of the genome, and then this one's taken from the fourth position, and this one's taken from the last position, if we know this complete order, it's really easy to do the assembly. We would just lay out our reads like this, and then collapse their sequences back together uh, by joining them at the positions where they overlap to reconstruct what that genome is. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know that. We don't actually know the ordering of the individual pieces. We only know their sequences. We don't know how they relate to each other. So we just have this big jumble of reads, and we need to computationally figure out what their ordering was along our genome sequence. Now, a key term that we're going to talk about, and it's probably come up already before in the course, is the idea of genome coverage. Now, the, to sequence our genome and to assemble it, we need to have redundant information. It's not just enough to sequence every base a single time, but we need to sequence enough bases such that the reads are going to overlap on the genome so we can find overlaps and then merge the reads together. So we typically aim for high coverage sequencing of around 30x, which is like what uh, Matthew was talking about. So the way that we define coverage is the average number of reads that cross a single position of our genome. 
uh, our genome sequence. So here we've sequenced 177 different nucleotides. Our genome sequence is 35 uh, nucleotides. So the average coverage is 177 divided by 35, which is about 7x. You wouldn't want to try to assemble a genome from only 7x coverage. And we typically want to get something like 30x. So the reads overlap by quite a lot. They have long overlaps. And also that we're almost guaranteed to have a read covering every position uh, of our genome. Okay, so the basic principle behind genome assembly is that in the absence of this information about what the order of the reads are in the reference genome, we can try to approximate it by looking for reads that have very similar sequences. So the idea is that if we find a read where the suffix or the end of one read matches the prefix or the beginning of another, where they have very high sequence similarity, where they share a lot of uh, bases that are matched to each other, there's a pretty good chance that they came from the same position of the genome and they're overlapping that position. So this example here, because of this read, the suffix matches the prefix here. Uh, we can infer that they probably came from overlapping regions of the genome and we could merge their sequence together to build a slightly longer sequence by just adding uh, this terminal suffix CC onto here and that's extended that read by a couple of bases. Okay, is this all clear? Like why we want to find overlaps between our, our reads? So the field of uh, genome assembly is sort of like a classic problem in bioinformatics for people who are interested in sequence analysis algorithms. Uh, and it's, the algorithms have been in development for probably over 30 years now, since Sanger uh, originally developed his, uh, his sequencing uh, method. I think the very first genomes were assembled by hand by like comparing these sequencing gels to each other and just lining them up into longer and longer pieces. Uh, but it was pretty obvious that we'd have to use computers to do this once we started sequencing things that were more than maybe 5,000 bases in length. Uh, so the classical way of doing uh, genome assembly was using what's called the overlap layout consensus paradigm. I'm going to walk through those three different steps uh, in a minute. And those were used for all the genomes that were sequenced with Sanger sequencing. They use this overlap layout consensus method of assembly. Uh, when short read sequencing, like Illumina sequencing, came, uh, came into prominence, uh, we found that we needed to develop entirely new classes of algorithms to handle the fact that the reads were very, very short and in huge abundance, where you could have a billion reads sequenced from a human genome. So my start in bioinformatics was developing algorithms to do short read assembly uh, using a technique that's called the brown graphs. And that's something I'm going to describe a little bit later on. But now that long reads are back in prominence uh, with PacBio Nanopore, as I described yesterday, these overlap layout consensus methods of assembly are now back being used for the, this type of data. And now the reason that we need to use different methods for short reads versus long reads are that they have very different characteristics. Long reads are maybe 10,000 bases in length, but have a 15% error rate. Short reads are 100 bases in length, but very, very accurate, where they might only have one in 200 base per error rate. So the algorithms that we are going to use have to be matched to the type of data that we have. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through uh, example pipelines for long and short read assembly. So here's what a long read assembly pipeline looks like. We start with our read sequences that come out of our sequencer, let's say a PacBio sequencer or, or the Oxford Nanopore sequencer. We're then going to build what's called an overlap graph, and I'll give an example of what an overlap graph is. We're then going to construct a layout, which means we're going to try to figure out this ordering of the reads along the genome. We're then going to merge their sequences together into contigs, which are the assembled segments of the genome. We're then going to run what we call a consensus algorithm, to get over sequencing error and improve the accuracy of our genome assembly. We're then going to output that into a FASTA file, which is our assembly uh, in a set of contents. So the first stage is finding overlaps. Uh, so to find overlaps, we're going to start with our big list of sequencing reads. So in this example, it's only you know, a little bit over 10 reads, but for a real sequencing project, it's gonna be a million reads. And then we're gonna start taking pairs of reads, comparing their sequences to each other, and figuring out where reads have a highly similar subsequence at the end of one read and the beginning of the other. So just like I showed in the previous example, the suffix of this read 
matches the prefix of this read. So we're going to say that they overlap. And we're going to start to construct an assembly graph where each one of our reads is a node or a vertex in the graph. And we're going to add an edge from the read that has a suffix to the read that has the matching prefix. And we're going to do this for essentially all pairs of reads in our sequencing data set. And we're going to build up this huge graph which models the relationship between these reads, where an edge going from one read to another read said that they have an overlap, and maybe they came from the adjacent position uh, in the genome that we sequenced. Now, here's an example uh, assembly graph for a very short sequencing project where we're just sequencing uh, this string and we've taken seven base pair reads. So each one of these seven base pair reads is a vertex in our graph and we've put an edge between them if they have an overlap. So here, uh, this read ends with the sequence ATTAT. This read begins with the sequence ATTAT. We put an edge between them and we denote that as a five base pair overlap. So just for this half of the room, we're looking at this read, uh, and the suffix of this read matches a prefix of this read, so we put an edge between them. And likewise, the suffix of this read matches a prefix of this read, and so on. So each time we see uh, an arrow or an edge in this graph, it's just saying that there's a relationship between the suffix and prefix uh, of those two reads. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We would. In here, we've only put an edge between reads that have an overlap of three bases. This is just a toy example. If you're sequencing with pack bio reads where maybe the read length is 10,000 bases, you might put a minimum length of the overlap on, say, 1,000 bases. The reason you want to put a minimum length on the overlap is you don't want spurious matches between repetitive sequence in the genome. And the general principle is that the longer your overlap length is, the less likely it is to be just a, a repeat-induced overlap. How do you zoom in the threshold Uh, typically, the assembler will do it for you. Um, they'll have it built in. You, the, the things you want to look at are the coverage of the genome. If you know the coverage of the genome and your average read length, you can calculate the probability of finding a thousand base pair overlap. And the assembler will take all that information into it and then set uh, the length of your overlap based on coverage and read length and genome size. So it's essentially automatically done. And if you want to read about the theory behind this, it's called uh, Lander-Waterman statistics, where they developed this model of, of sequencing coverage and how long your overlap should be, depending on uh, how much you sequence. And it's sort of a classic paper uh, in this field. Um, the overlap is relative to the ends, or uh, one we can entirely be inside of another yeah, you can. Those are that's a special case of overlap that we call contained reads, where one read is a perfect or almost perfect substring of another read. Typically, when the assembler sees that a read is contained with another one, it will just discard it from the assembly. It doesn't actually <clears throat> add any information about you know the con how context should be built. So you just throw out any reads that are contained. So it won't be in the graph. It won't be in the graph. It'll just get discarded. That's right. All right, so we have our overlap graph here. It's not too complex. We maybe can see a path through here uh, that reconstructs this string. Uh, of course, this is just a toy problem, and real genomes uh, are going to look a lot more awful. Uh, okay, so we've built our overlap graph. Next step is to then construct a layout by uh, bundling stretches of our overlap graph into contigs. So I'm going to quickly move from giving examples in DNA to giving examples in words, just because it's a little bit easier to uh, visualize what a repeat looks like in one of these graphs. So we're now going to construct the overlap graph for this uh, fragment of a famous song from the 1970s, uh, which goes to everything, turn, 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 there is a season. So you can see why I picked this string. There's this repeat of the word turn three times in the middle of this string. So this is a good way of visualizing what happens to these assembly graphs uh, when we have repeats. So we've broken up our string into uh, pieces of length 7 again. And the individual pieces of length 7 are the vertices in our graph. Then we found overlaps between these, uh, between these words. And the assembly graph uh, is at the bottom here. So here it's quite a bit more complicated than the toy example we saw before. 
we can see there's you know some structure going on here, you know something quite awful happening here, and then something a little more simple here. But just by looking at this graph by eye, it's not really apparent you know what the structure of this sentence is. So we need to first do a step to to clean up the graph a little bit. So one step that we can do to clean up the graph is re uh, removing redundant edges from our assembly graph. So let's look at the structure that has this blue, these blue edges and this green edge here. And up here, these two blue edges and this green edge here. Now, we said that this edge from this vertex down to this vertex is a transitive edge as it's, this spells out the same sequence as these two blue edges here. So this transitive edge, which bypasses this node, is actually giving us redundant information on our graph, and we don't actually need it. Uh, it doesn't add any information, just like these contained reads. So we're going to pre-process the graph by looking for these transitive edges, which are edges that just bypass one of the nodes, like here or here, and removing them from our overlap graph. So let's look at uh, transitive introduction. Here's our original graph, and we're going to get rid of edges that bypass a single node like this. So we've gotten rid of those edges, and we now have something that's quite a bit cleaner than before. We can see some more structure here. It's a little bit simpler by getting rid of those edges. But still, there's some redundant edges, like this one that bypasses here, or you know, this one that bypasses here. So we're going to take this a step further and now remove edges that bypass two nodes. So we've gotten rid of uh, second degree transitive edges and now we have a much more simple graph structure. We can see that there's this linear chain of nodes here, there's this linear chain of nodes here, and then something more complicated going on here. And now this is exactly what an assembler wants to see. It doesn't want these graphs that have these tangles and edges going in all these different directions. It wants these linear stretches. Because whenever we can see a linear stretch in the graph, we can unambiguously merge those sequences together without any chance of a misassembly. So you can, whenever you see a linear unbranched path, you can just say, okay, this is a contig, I know this is a unique stretch of the, the genome, I'm going to put those together and then I'm going to stop. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to find our linear stretches here. The first one spells out this uh, fragment to everything turn. This one spells out turn, there's a season. And then we have this unresolvable repeat in here, which has a branching structure that we can't resolve without having a chance of making a misassembly. And the reason we have this repeat is because you could have had three turns there, turn, turn, turn. You could have had four turns, turn, 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 turn. And you don't know the actual copy number of that repeat. If we had longer reads, if we take longer stretches of that that went from all the way across those three occurrences of that word, we could have resolved it uniquely, but unfortunately we don't. We only had seven uh, character uh, reads here, so we had to stop. So we put out two contigs, one for uh, the unique stretch of the genome. In the unresolvable repeat, yeah. there's also like a transient edge, right? Uh, this edge, which, which one? The, the, the bottom one. This one? Yeah. It's actually not transitive because it's, it's hard to see on here, but the arrow is pointing into this one, oh, this direction. Okay. If the arrow was in on the other side, then it would be a transitive edge. If we could. Then you can do the like the content? Yeah, but this edge, yeah, we, we, if the other arrow is going here, we could remove it. But because it's going back, it's a loop rather than a transitive edge. So this loop would allow the assembler to just keep cycling in this position and keep inserting the word turn, 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 turn. We don't want that, so we're just going to give up on trying to assemble this. Yeah. Um, it does appear to have a, a trans, uh, transitively inferable edge if you skip three nodes. Is there a reason you don't do that? Um, no, it's just for illustration here. You could get rid of this edge. Yeah, there. that top one. Um, but it, 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 fundamentally, the problem is this. Right. Sequence but here. you could keep simplifying three nodes, four nodes, five yeah. nodes. Yeah. Real assemblers will like get rid of all transitive edges, not just one or two uh, jumps, but here it's just for illustration. We only did two steps. Was there another question over here? I thought somebody had a hand up. So I, I just want to know if like a new gene is published, um, is it acceptable that like we visit those positions that have some ambiguity regarding the repeats and like fix this later? Yeah, absolutely. So 
you know, in when we're sequencing genomes of Sanger sequencing, there's quite a high standard to publish a genome. You know, people would want very long contigs. They'd want the contigs built into higher order structure, which we call scaffolds, which are going to come to a little bit. Uh, but since high throughput short read sequencing came out, you know, the standard for publishing a genome uh, dropped and it was okay just to assemble things to 10,000 base pair pieces and then put it into a genome database. And people do go back, get long reads, get different site types of information to try to finish or improve the, uh, the genomes by filling in uh, these repetitive regions. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it, the reads like s will span every position of that. Um, but all the assembler will know is that there's at least three copies, but not it could be four copies or could be five copies or any number of copies, all just based on the structure of the copy. So it can resolve the number of copies, which is the problem here. Okay, so how, in those cases where there's contained elements, how do we know to remove those versus um, well, when we go back to construction the assembly graph, the overlap detection part, uh, it will find, uh, you know, we'll run an overlap detection algorithm, which is you know, the standard programs out there, are really fast ones called Minimap2, um, and it will output these type of relationships. But if this read, say, was four bases shorter, so it only aligned to this position, we'd be able to tell from the output of Minimap 2 that it ended internally within this read, and then we would discard it. So the only the, the read in this case only becomes apparent when we look across multiple load nodes and we see that cycle at the graph. Does that make sense? So with the, the two contacts that it named, that yeah. does it show Um, yeah, it will show, let's go back, yeah, so both contigs end and start with part of the repeat, and then embedded within this structure here, there's multiple other copies. So the assembler has essentially said, yeah, I know I have two copies of this at least, but there's possibly more uh, buried in that structure. So it only knows for sure that's true. <coughs> Yeah, it, well, it, it knows there's uh, more than two. Okay. It outputs two, but it knows just because of like the, the fact that there's a loop in here that there's there's more confidence, but it doesn't know how many exactly. Would your assembler only throw out substrings with perfect matches to another string, or uh, if there's some mismatches, would it keep it? It will. It, it's it's another one of these threshold parameters, like okay. you know when we're finding overlaps. How many mismatches are we going to tolerate in the overlap? Typically, it's set to be a percentage, like say three percent or four uh, percent. But of course, it depends on your sequencing technology as well. Um, so when when it finds overlaps and it finds containments, it will throw it out if it's a percentage of difference between them. If you have two pack bio reads, which are fifteen percent error rate, you're essentially doubling the error rate when you compare the two. So it might allow up to like thirty percent differences. Um, which was why, you know, very when PacBio data first became available, it was thought to be like virtually impossible to assemble just because the error rate was too so high, and finding you know overlaps with thirty percent differences is quite daunting. Uh, but then, as like all good scientific work, somebody just showed it was possible, and then we all went, okay, it is possible. So let's work on that. Okay, so the last step, once we've, uh, sorry, was there another question that I skipped? I want to make sure I got to everybody. Are we okay with, with the layouts? Okay. Uh, so the last step is uh, doing this consensus uh, approach where we want to calculate the final genome assembly. So as we've talked about, all reads have sequencing errors, um, and we don't want to just stitch the read sequences together or else we're going to start adding sequencing errors into our assembly. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to take all of our reads and then take the majority base at every position of our reads as our output into uh, output of our genome assembly. Because we're taking the majority 
uh, we can imagine as if each read had a vote on what the true base is at every possession. So we call this the consensus algorithm, We're taking a consensus over every one of the reads. So to do this, we construct a multiple alignment where we line all of the reads against each other, and then we just iterate over every column of this multiple alignment and take the most frequently observed base. And that goes into our final uh, genome assembly. So here, there's uh, one read had a little insertion here. The other reads said that there is no base there. So we put a gap in the final consensus sequence. And likewise, well, although we have sequencing errors at some positions, uh, we just we, we, we take, take the majority, which is the true nucleotide sequence, and we get a high accuracy uh, consensus down here. Okay, so that's how long read assemblies, uh, assemblers work. Later on, you're going to run the CANU assembler, C-A-N-U, which is by Adam Philippi's group at the NHGRI. Uh, and it's basically doing these three steps of finding an overlap, finding overlaps, constructing a layout, uh, and then calling a consensus sequence. Uh, very early on when we had Illumina data, people would try to use these assemblers on Illumina data. You'd try to run the Solera assembler uh, on Illumina data, and they would just completely fail. The reason that they'd fail is that when we construct <clears throat> our overlap graph, we're essentially comparing all pairs of reads to each other. And if you have an Illumina run uh, for a human genome, you might have a billion reads. <clears throat> there is a billion squared pairs of reads, which is far too many to try to practically screen and find overlaps between them. So we've had to develop this entirely new class of algorithms, which was pioneered by uh, Pavel Pesner at uh, UC San Diego, uh, which is based on uh, an algorithm called the DeBrown graph. So here's what a short reassembly uh, pipeline looks at. We're going to start by error correcting our reads. So we're going to look for sequencing errors in our reads, try to get rid of them. We're then going to construct our DeBrown graph. We're then going to process the graph to clean it up of edges that we don't want. Uh, similar to these transitive edges that we just talked about for uh, long read assembly graphs. We're then going to assemble our contigs and then do some paired end resolution by constructing scaffolds and filling in the gaps. All right, so here is uh, an error profile for a set of Illumina. So here's six different Illumina data sets. So this is data that we used uh, in an assembly benchmarking competition called the Assemblathon. Uh, I'm going to come back to the assemblathon later on. Uh, we have a yeast data set, a uh, fish, which was a Lake Malawi cichlid, uh, a boa constrictor snake, human genome, uh, a parakeet, and an oyster genome. The oyster wasn't part of the assemblathon, but it's a useful data set uh, to, to describe anyways. Um, this is essentially looking at how often bases are incorrect as a function of the position of the base within the sequencing read. And just like as I mentioned yesterday in talking about sequencing technology, the classic Illumina profile is that the error rate increases towards the three prime end of the read. And we see this in each one of our data sets where the reads are very, very accurate at the beginning. And then as you go into these later cycles, uh, the error rate increases. Uh, so what we want to do, so these errors are going to cause uh, erroneous structures in our assembly graph, and they're actually going to balloon the amount of memory it takes uh, to run a genome assembly. So what we want to do is run a pre-processing step on our data, which is going to error correct our sequencing reads. And the way that we error correct our sequencing reads is looking at what we call Kamer counts. So let's consider a read that has a single sequencing error, sort of near the end. It's this red C here. Now, I've already talked about why we want to sequence the genome deeply. We want redundant information. We want to sequence to 30, 40, 50x data, which is going to give us power to find overlaps. But it also helps us error correct our, our reads. And if you just count the number of times short subsequences of our reads, which we call KMERS, in this case, uh, we're taking 21 base pair sequences. If we count the number of times each KMER occurs across all of our sequencing reads, the KMERs that don't contain sequencing errors are going to be seen many, many times, in this case 40 times, and the KMERs that do contain sequencing errors are going to be seen few times, in this case just a single time. So whenever we have a sequencing error, that essentially flips a KMER that's seen 
uh, you know, 40 or 50 times to a camera that's seen a single time. So this gives us an incredibly efficient way of finding where the sequencing errors in our reads, as we can just count the number of times these short words uh, appear, and then if it's lower than a threshold, we're going to say it's an error, we'd then try to fix every base to flip that from a low coverage camera to a high coverage camera. Now the reason this is efficient is it doesn't involve any sort of dynamic programming. We're not aligning any reads to each other. All we do is just insert these short words into something like a hash table, and then we can count the number of occurrences that they uh, that they have. You do that for every read, yeah. Basically, kind of that would be on camera for every read. So you kind of like, are you breaking up what's already in the read, and then just doing a window throughout? Yeah. So what you're going to do is you're going to take you're going to initialize an empty hash table. You're going to iterate over every read yeah. and every camer of that read, mm -hmm. insert it into the hash table. Once we're done that, we have a uh, hash table that's populated with every camer and its frequency, the number of times it's been seen across our entire data set. And the camer is based on like breaking up what you see in a read. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let's let's take just five mers here. Mm -hmm. The first five mer of our read is A C G A T. The second five is C, G, A, T, G. So we're just going to slide that five base per window yeah. across our entire sequence and insert those into the hash table. And so how are errors then? Like, because if you're basing your KMR based on uh, that read, you're going to create the KMR to include the error. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but like, because errors tend to be rare and you know uniformly distributed across the re uh, across the genome. We expect that whenever we see and have a sequencing error, that creates a unique camer that's only been seen that single one time in that read. Okay. If it didn't have an error, we would see it, you know, it, the, the number of times we see it is in proportion to whatever our sequencing depth is. Okay. So it allows us to distinguish between reads with errors mm -hmm. or versus reads without errors just by looking at these camer frequencies. Um, Right, so once we've identified our cameras that contain sequencing errors, we just start flipping the bases to see if one of the uh, changes turns it into a camera that's seen you know, 40 or 50 times. If it has, we change that and output a new set of reads uh, with our corrected sequences. So there's a lot of software that will do this. Um, there's a, one of the first camera based error correctors was called Quake. Others, one that I wrote in the assembler SGA, Soap de Novo has one, that is BFC, Bless, Lighter Musket, and probably uh, many others since I made these slides. Uh, the reason that we do this, though, is that the older way of doing error correction was looking for pairwise overlaps between the reads and then calculating a multiple alignment. Uh, that's far too slow for a large Illumina data set, so we use uh, these camera methods. All right, we've error corrected our reads. Now we want to construct our graph. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're going to use uh, what we call a Brown graph. Now, John Brown graph is this fundamental data set, data structure for short read assembly. So I'm going to take some time to go through it. It's also based on KMERS, just like uh, the KMERS that we uh, we saw for error correction. And to construct the Brown graph, we're going to take uh, all of our reads, and here we have five reads, each of six bases in length. We're going to take the first four bases of this read, which is our camera size, and we're going to insert it into our graph, CCGT. We're then going to take the next four base pair subsequence of this read, CGTTA, and we're going to put it into our graph. And because these two cameras were adjacent in a read, we're going to put an edge between them. And we're going to do that for every camer of our, uh, in, our, in our read set. And whenever we see cameras that are adjacent in our read, we put an edge. So for the benefit of this half of the room, we're going to put an a, a vertex in the graph for this camera, CGTT, here. And we're going to put an edge, uh, sorry, a vertex in the graph for this camera, GTTA, here. And then because they're adjacent in our reads, we put an edge in between the point graph. Now this seems like a silly thing to do. We're taking our short reads and we're breaking them up into even shorter pieces. Why would we do this? Uh, this is really, really fast to do. You can do this just using hash tables. Uh, computer scientists and programmers like me spend a lot of time optimizing performance of hash tables. So we can do this in a few hours for an Illumina data set for a human genome, rather than months or years if we we're trying to construct overlap graphs. 
And it also has a really interesting property in that it handles repetitive regions of the genome uh, really elegantly. Now this camer in red here is special in that it has two different extensions to it. It's connected to this camer, GTTA, and this camer, GTTC. So we'd say that this camer is a repetitive camer uh, in our genome. And the graph will branch where there's two possibilities. We can either follow this path or this path here. So why this makes it nice to work with is that it compacts all of our repeats in our genome down to this Kamer level information. We don't have this explosion of edges like we saw in that sentence that we saw before. We just have these Kamers that are branch points our graph. So it makes a very compact representation uh, of the repeats in our genome. Well, it depends on your age, right? Because, if, for example, the upper row also starts expanding, like expanding. Like, yes. Yeah. So. If, this, if, if they're sort of nested reads, it can keep expanding, but you're not going to have, in, in an overlap graph, the number of edges grows quadratically with, the, with the, num the repeat copy. In this graph, each repeat copy gets collapsed down to single nodes, so it grows linearly with, with the repeat copy. So it has a much better growth structure uh, than, than for overlaps. Now this graph is interesting. There is actually a unique path that reconstructs it. If you start here, follow this path here, loop back around and go up here, you have a unique construction of the genome. But again, this is just a toy problem. Uh, for real assemblies, there isn't usually a unique path uh, that will assemble it. All right, we're not quite ready to assemble contigs yet. Uh, next, we need to clean up our graph of erroneous edges. So there's two types of errors uh, or erroneous edges that we need to get rid of. There's uh, one type that's called tips, which are short branches off our graph that just terminate nowhere. So we have this nice linear part of the graph, that's what our assembler wants, and then it diverges here for four nodes, it diverges here for two nodes. Now the reason these uh, structures appear are sometimes we can't error correct our uh, every error in our reads. So we have a leftover error here and a leftover error here. Because of the fact that errors tend to be unique, <clears throat> they just create these divergences that overhang off here. So these branches, these camers, are all just corresponding to errors and they don't connect anywhere. They're not giving us any information of the, uh, of the, of the structure of our genome. So what we want to do is just trim those uh, branches off the graph by removing those sequencing errors. Now there's another type of graph structure that we're interested in. If you sequence diploid genomes, which has heterozygous SNPs, our graph structure is going to have branch points where there's any sort of allelic uh, differences. So if there's a heterozygous SNP at this point, at this uh, blue G, we're going to have one path through the graph that follows allele 1, and one path of, through the graph that follows allele 2, where they diverge at this SNP position, and then come back together once our camera window has slid past that SNP. Now the assembler wants linear structures in the graph, so it's going to look for these structures and try to get rid of them. How does it decide which one to take? Uh, it usually just makes an arbitrary choice. It, usually it'll pick the one with higher coverage, um, but if, if it is a true header's like a SNP, then you just get a random allele in there. Uh, that's actually something that trips up people quite often, is that they want to know what SNPs are in their genome. The assembler does not, so it will get rid of them. Some assemblers will write it to a file and say, I removed a bubble at this position, and it had this uh, alternative allele. Okay, so we've constructed a brown graph from our uh, Illumina reads. It might look something like this. It's complicated, not as complicated as we saw from the overlap graph. But again, we want to clean it up to make the true structure of the genome <clears throat> a little bit more apparent. So what we're going to do is first find all of our tips in the graph. These are these branches that lead nowhere. We're then going to... Sorry, Microsoft wants to auto-update something. I do not want to let it. Uh, right, so we're going to find these tips uh, and then traverse backwards until they rejoin the graph and then prune off these structures. So already we can see that just by getting rid of these alternatives that lead nowhere, we have a much cleaner graph. We're then going to iterate over the 
points of divergence in a graph, see if they rejoin at some common vert vertex. If they do, we'll say that there's a bubble there. We'll call it as allelic divergence and then collapse that down by just removing one half of the bubble. And already we now see the graph is quite clean. And what we can do is just start compacting these linear stretches of the graph, which the assembler likes to see, into our context. We still have some repeats left over here, like here and here that have broken up our contigs, but that's typically unavoidable uh, with short read assemblies, uh, just because the read length isn't long enough to, to cross all repeats in the genome. Uh, if we have paired end data, which has come up a few times in this course, we can do a little bit better though, uh, in that we can try to scaffold our contigs together. So what we mean by scaffold is just constructing higher order structures where we're going to stitch our contigs together and we're going to say contig A is followed by contig B, but we don't know the sequence in between them. So we're going to skip over the repeats and just fill in the, uh, the scaffold with ends in between those contigs. The way that we're going to construct scaffolds is that we're going to take our paired end reads, we're going to align them to our contig sequences, and we're going to see where there's a group of pairs that align to the end of one contig and then the start of another contig. So I've color coded them here, these blue pairs, uh, half of the pair aligned here, half the pair aligned here, these red pairs, half aligned here, half aligned here, uh, this is purple, it's hard to see, half here, half here half here and half here. So the fact that there's pairs going from one contig to another contig allows us to say, okay, these probably came together on the genome, let's join them up. So what the assembler will do is that it will uh, it'll formalize this, look for uh, contigs that had a statistically significant number of pairs joining them. It will then use this insert or fragment size distribution to estimate how far apart those contigs are. It'll then output a scaffold with ends in between them based on the gaps, gap size that it inferred uh, from that fragment size distribution. You can only do it only if you have uh, paired? Yeah, you can only do it if you have paired end data. Yeah. Uh, there's older, when, when people are really interested in doing a lot of Illumina genome assemblies, uh, they developed protocols for getting very long range paired end reads, which are called mate pairs, where you could sequence uh, reads that were five kilobases apart. Those were really useful for scaffolding your genomes uh, because you could jump over much longer repeats if you have pairs that are very, very far apart. Uh, those aren't as common anymore just because long reads have become fairly cheap to get. All right, in the final stage, you can try to do a local assembly uh, like we were talking about for variant calling to try to fill in those gaps by uh, having slightly more permissive assembly parameters and only looking at reads that align into those gaps between our contigs. Uh, you can also use get, um, other sequencing technology, like if you have a draft genome assembly uh, with Illumina scaffolds, you could then align pack bio data to your scaffold to try to improve it like we were talking about. Uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, what should you expect from a genome assembly? How good is your genome assembly going to be? Um, for bacterial genomes, which are typically very small in the, on the order of a few megabases in length, if you have short reads, your, set, your genome will probably assemble to with about a few hundred contigs, where the average contig length is about 10 to 100,000 bases. If you have long reads like PacBio or Nanopore, you'll typically get a handful of contigs, maybe between one and five. Uh, and often the entire genome will be assembled into a single piece. Uh, the reason that this is, is that in many bacterial genomes, the longest repeat is around 6,000 bases, which is the ribosomal RNA sequence. Um, and uh, if you have reads that are longer than 6,000 bases, you'll typically be able to span that repeat and, and then be able to assemble your genome. Uh, if you have large genomes like a human genome or say some uh, crop genome, your contigs from short reads will typically be around 10,000 bases in length. Uh, for long reads, they'll be a few million bases in length. Of course, long read data assembly is, uh, long read data is much more expensive to generate. Uh, so whether that's the right technology depends on you know, how many genomes you want to sequence, what you want to get out of your genomes. Okay, that is the assembly theory section. Is there any questions? Yes. Yeah, it does. Um, if you have uh, if you have low coverage, like less than 30x, you're going to have uh, more contigs, and they're going to be shorter. Um, this sort of assumes 
sort of ideally if you've sequenced to 30, 40, 50x, which is what most people recommend, uh, what, what length of contigs you'll get. You get, uh, if you did 30x from, yeah, short or long reads, short reads you'd get about 10,000 base pair contigs, long reads you'd get about a million or more. Was there another question? Yeah. About the motivation of doing assemblies to begin with, I mean, can you give an example of why would I want to use assembly versus reference genome? Sure. Um, well, the best example is if you don't have a reference genome, and that's the primary use is if, you know, um, there's a lot of a lot of bacterial genomes that haven't been sequenced before. Like uh, we're here in a cancer research institute. Obviously, there's a very high quality human reference genome, so most of our analysis will be reference based. Um, but you know, there are pitfalls to lining to a reference. Things like finding very complex structure variation doesn't work very well when you're lining to the reference. Um, if there's novel sequence, you know, if we take any one of us sequence our genome compared to the reference genome, there's probably something like five to ten megabases of sequence that just isn't present in the reference at all. You have no information about that sequence if you use a, a reference-based strategy. Um, yeah, so, so essentially, anytime you want to find something that's more than you know, SNPs or small indels or very clean structure variations, it's going to be better to use an assembly strategy. You know, I, it's, it's sort of self-serving to say this because I, I work on genome assemblies, but as long read technology become better, I think we're going to switch from things being primarily alignment based to being primarily assembly based. And I think we're sort of at that, that inflection point now where it's starting to be impossible to do, you know, multiple long read human genome assemblies as, as another source of like reference material. You don't have a way to compare yourself. Like when you do assemblies, you don't have a way to know if you're right or wrong within yourself, right? Well, um, if you're doing like, if you do a human assembly of a human genome, then you would, would align it to the reference to do your comparison. If you're just doing, you know, a complete de novo project and you have no information about it, um, you know, there's, there is no way to, to verify that. You know, you can get orthogonal sequencing data, like typically if you'll do a pack bio assembly, you'll then get some Illumina data to map to, the re to your newly assembled reference to assess how accurate the genome is. Um, but yeah, you, you'd need to use different orthogonal ways to, to verify that your assembly is correct. Okay, any more before I uh, move on to the last part of this talk? Okay, so this isn't the Assemblathon project. Um, the goal of the Assemblathon, I mentioned this already, was to benchmark genome assemblers. So uh, a group at UC Davis went out, sequenced three genomes that don't have a reference genome. They released them to the assembly uh, community, people like me who developed de novo assemblers, and they wanted us to run our assemblers and then they would do experimental comparisons to uh, say what the best assemblers were. And the conclusions, and you can read it uh, yourself at this, this inset here, is that essentially there's no single approach that works well for all genomes or all species. Some assemblers did really well on one of the three species and then poorly on the others. Um, and some species were really easy to assemble by any of the assemblers tested, and some are more difficult. So this got me thinking about the question of like, what makes it difficult to assemble some genome that we're given? And I kind of want to throw that out to people and don't look ahead at the next slide because that's where the answers are. But what kind of, what kind of features would make a, a given assembly difficult? It's like either the genome or the data quality. We've heard a couple already. Repetitive, repetitive sequence, exactly. That's a big one. How repetitive is the genome you're trying to sequence? And, and GC content. GC content, exactly. Um, both because it's going to make the genome look more repetitive if you have very biased sequencing data, but also it's much more difficult to get uniform coverage across the genome if there's extreme GC content. Low coverage. Low coverage, exactly. A lot of people, they, if you don't know the genome size, you might say, okay, it's one gigabase, order the amount of sequencing data to give you 30x coverage for a one gigabase genome. If it turns out to be two gigabases, you only have 15x, and your genome's going to be very difficult to assemble. Poor quality. Sorry? Poor quality. Poor quality reads, exactly. If your reads have very high error rate, 
Uh, it's going to make it more difficult to error correct the data, and it also lowers the effective coverage uh, of your data set. Anything else? I guess if you don't have a reference genome to compare it to nothing, like if it's completely new, 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 and like you don't have anything to compare it to, yeah, in the, to verify it. Yeah, and it's going to be difficult to do like the, the analysis of whether your assembly is good or not, for sure. If it's a tumor sample, for example. If it's a tumor sample? Yeah. Maybe very hard to know. Yeah, exactly. What I'm what I'm going to take from that is that tumors can be seen as like a population where there's a variation in the population at different frequencies. You can have mutations that are clonal. You can have mutations that are subclonal. Um, the analogous <laughs> the analogy in assembly is often if somebody's sequencing something that's quite small and difficult <laughs> to get a lot of DNA from. They might take multiple individuals and pool DNA. Yeah. Assembling from a population is very, very difficult because there you're introducing all sorts of variation between the individuals in the population. And it's the exact same as if you're trying to assemble a cancer genome. Anything else? Another one launching off that is just if there's a lot of heterozygosity in the genome. If you, you know, human genomes have a SNP about every 1,000 bases, that's not too difficult for the assembler to resolve these bubble structures. Um, but there's, there's some, some organisms like we're going to see that have a SNP every 100 bases. Those are very, very difficult to assemble. I think that's a pretty good list. Anything else before I, I switch over to the next slide? All right. So we got most of them, repetitive sequence, high heterozygosity, low coverage, biased sequence because of GC content, high error rate. Uh, something we didn't get is chimeric reads. So often if your library prep goes wrong, you might end up sequencing two different DNA molecules in the same read. The assembler really, really does not like that because it looks like structure variation. Uh, so you want to avoid chimeras uh, at all costs. Uh, if you have sequencing adapters in your read, those also look like very high copy repeats. Um, so you want to avoid doing, uh, having any sequencing adapters. You can use these trimming programs that we heard about to get rid of those. Um, sequencing multiple individuals like this population, or just if your sample has been contaminated by you know, somebody else's sample that they were, they were preparing at the same time. Uh, that's going to make your assembly much more difficult. <coughs> All right, so with... Yep. Um, so sometimes if, when you're doing a library prep, particularly PCR based, uh, the PCR can ligate two different molecules of DNA together. Then when they get sequenced, it's a read that came from two independent pieces of the genome that gets put into the same read. And we call those a chimeric read. Um, and they confuse the assembler because they create a a path through the graph from one part of the ref one part of the genome to a different part of the genome. So they cause they they make it look like repeats, but they're just like artificially induced repeats by a, a flaw in the library preparation step. They typically occur at like a very low rate, so you know you don't have to worry about them too much. But the assemblers will typically have special code to look for structures that are only supported by you know one or two reads, and then try to get rid of them. Okay, so with all these things in mind, um, I set out to write a program that would take a raw a set of Illumina reads and assess whether any of these factors are going to cause difficulty during your genome assembly. Uh, this program is called pre-QC, it's pre-assembly quality control, and it's similar to these fast QC programs that we saw uh, early on, and that except it's more focused towards doing a de novo genome assembly. Uh, and the way, the way that it works is it's based on KMER coverage, just like we're seeing for error correction. We're going to take these short KMERs, we're going to count how many times that they occur, and this gives us a lot of information about uh, the different properties of our genome. So here's a histogram of how many times 51 MERS occur in this test human data set. There's two features that I want to point out here. There's this large peak here where the KMER coverage is around 25 to 30x. Those are genomic KMERs. These are the KMERs that are useful for genome assembly, and they occur roughly 25 to 30 times, which was our sequencing coverage uh, for this sample. There's another peak, which is up here at KMER count of 1, 
over here. Those are, sequ uh, those are k-mers that contain sequencing errors. Those are the ones that we want to correct. So just by looking at the relative height of these two different peaks, we can essentially figure out how uh, accurate our sequencing reads are. If the reads are, have more errors, the height of this single k-mer peak uh, is going to be higher. If there's fewer errors, it's going to be lower. But there's another feature in this that's not that apparent uh, on this histogram. But if we look at this other data set, we see there's something odd going on here. And this is this oyster data set that I've included just because I love showing this plot. Does so anybody want to take a guess at what's happening in this, why we have this extra mode in this peak, in this distribution? It is deployed, you're, you're close. So what, what would these two peaks be if this is a diploid genome? Heterozygous. Exactly, heterozygous. So this oyster genome, and they only found out about this, or uh, it only became apparent after they sequenced it, has a SNP at about every 80 bases. It's extremely heterozygous. And it's so heterozygous that we can quite clearly see that there's this cluster of camers that have half of the depth of the other ones. So we can partition this into camers that are homozygous, present on both alleles, and heterozygous that are present on only one of the two alleles. Now, this assembly failed spectacularly. It did not work at all because this genome has such high heterozygosity and it had to use an entirely different way of sequencing uh, to get around the fact that, uh, that, that there is so much heterozygosity. If we flip back to the human one for just a little bit, if we look really close, we can see a little shoulder on this distribution here, which are the heterozygous camers in the human genome. So there's adding a little bit of density at half of the coverage peak, uh, but it's not so much to affect the assembly because it's only about one in a thousand uh, camers that have that property. All right, so we can take this a step further and build our entire de Brown graph and process the graph and classify these structures that we've talked about into different classes. We can have structures caused by sequencing errors in red, structures caused by SNPs and indels, heterozygosity in green, structures caused by repeats in blue. I'm not going to go over the model of how we do this classification, but if we run this on these different assemblathon genomes, we can use that to figure out how heterozygous the genomes are. So here, this oyster genome, the heterozygosity is calculated to be one in about 100 bases, uh, and the human genome is calculated to be about one in 1,000 bases, with the other assemblathon genomes falling in between those two extremes. So this immediately, if you ran this program, looked at this data set, and you see that heterozygosity is about one in 100 bases, this should put up a big red flag that, you know, it's going to be a very, very difficult genome to assemble. Uh, conversely, if you have a human genome, you know, you see one in 1,000 bases, that's not too bad. We, the assemblers are pretty good at, at, uh, at assembling genomes that are that heterozygous. We can also look at the frequency of repeat branches. Here, the human genome and the oyster genome are pretty comparable in repeat content, where there's a, a repeat-induced branch around uh, one in a few hundred bases, which is what we, which is uh, fairly well known for human genomes. And the other genomes, like this bird genome here, we see that it's much less repetitive compared to the other ones. And when we went to assemble that in the assemblathon data set, it was one of the easier uh, genomes to assemble. Uh, the program will also predict the genome size for you. So here the human genome is predicted, predicted to be about three gigabases. Uh, that's good because that's about how large it is. These other genomes like the Bo constrictor is about one and a half gigabases. Uh, the Lake Malawi cichlid is about a gigabase. And our control data set, our easy control data set here, the yeast genome, is correctly predicted to be about 12 megabases. So what this program gives you is you can just take a raw set of sequencing data that you know nothing about, run it through this program, and it will estimate these type of characteristics for you. It's going to tell you how big the genome is. It's going to tell you roughly how heterozygous it is and how repetitive it is. And then that will give you some information about how difficult it's going to be uh, to do that assembly. Uh, it will also just calculate basic summary stats, like the average quality scores of your reads uh, across the length of the read. As we see, quality scores decrease towards the three prime end of the read, 
uh, because that's the, sequ the uh, Illumina sequencing error mode. Uh, and it'll actually run a simulated genome assembly for you with different, different values of this Kamer size that we use for the Brown graph and estimate how long the contigs will be uh, for that Kamer uh, size. And we see that the yeast genome, which is easiest to assemble, has fairly long contigs, around 30,000 bases. This oyster genome, which is very difficult to assemble, has the shortest contigs uh, of less than 10,000 bases. Again, just giving you some indication of how difficult these assemblies are going to be. Okay, I think it's time for the coffee break. Just to wrap up, uh, give you an overview of how assemblers work. Tried to get across the idea that short and read assemblers, uh, assemblies require different methods because of the different characteristics of those data sets. And then in the last few minutes, we've talked about what factors make a given assembly difficult uh, or easy. Um, I'll take any questions now, but if I don't get your question or you have questions later on when working through your own data set, feel free just to drop me an email uh, at my OIS, OIS your address here. But before coffee, any, any more questions? Yeah, so this uh, this one here is not exactly the same as you know the genome coverage that I, I described to you before because Kamer coverage is going to be a fraction of genome coverage, but we're at about 27, 28x, 51 mer coverage, which which corresponds to about 40x uh, base level coverage. It's it sort of it does a little confusing, but this this is uh correlated with genome coverage, this, this plot. Yeah, that's a really good question. And something people, you know, when, when we started doing the brown graph assembly, uh, a very common thing to do is you take your genome, your, your, your sequencing reads, and you'd run the assembler with all possible K, and then pick whatever, where, whatever one gave you the longest context. Um, after having you know a few years of experience and where data standards became uh, you know solidified, where everybody got about 40x, 50x coverage for your data, the field is essentially settled on using 51 to 61 MERS for your assembly. The Kamer size is a balance between you want to use long Kamers because they're better at crossing repetitive regions, but if you use too long of Kamers, your genome's not going to be completely covered by a, a single Kamer. So like, if you have 100 base pair reads, you think you might think, okay, great, I'm going to use 99 base pair Kamers or 100 base pair Kamers. But it's very unlikely that you have a read starting from every single position on your, on your genome, so you need to shorten the Kamers such that the genome's well covered by, by these short subsequences.